the human right. Uh, consequently, non-participation of women uh, offers a democratic problem. And since women make up half of the population, it is essential that this is also reflected in a country's leadership. And I'm asked especially to draw upon the experience from Norway. My personal political engagement started back in the beginning of the 1970s, when the question of women's rights was high on the political agenda. And the women movement uh, was rising and feminism became a term of importance. Both internally in my own Christian Democratic Party and in public life in general, I met women reflecting upon gender roles and women's right to participation. And there was and still is an active women's movement internally in my party and in other political parts of Norway. Today, gender equality in government in Norway is a matter of course. And the idea of inequality seems foreign and strange. However, this is a result of changes in norms and values achieved through hard work and through legislation. Women and men attained equal rights to vote and to be elected in Norway back in 1913. And it was not before in the 1950s that women used their right to vote approximately as much as men did. And non, not until after the 1970s did the larger part of women expand considerably in all parts of the political life. This was in great part due to campaigns to promote more women into public life, as well as changes in legislation and in the political parts, party's own rules of quotation. We have already discussed quotation here today. In Norway, we have a proportional election system. And in each constituency, we have 19 of them, it is normal that the party congress put up a list with, if it's a man, number one, it will be a woman, number two, a man, number three, a woman, number four, and so on. Or opposite, you can start with a woman and so a man. And, and consequently, the result is that in the Norwegian parliament today, we have around 40% women. And this has been the case over the last elections. We have also a quota system within most of the political parties when we elect members of the board of the party. And we had a very interesting uh, experience in my own political party some years ago, because we have a quota system saying that at least 40% should be women, at least 40% men. And first they had a free election of candidates to the board, and the result was more than 60% women and less than 40% men. And consequently they had to take a new round of election to secure at least 40% men. So the men needed the quota to get 40% of the members of the board of my party some years back. That was interesting. Another point is that uh, when Gru Hallen Brundtland, uh, Brundtland founded uh, her government back in 1986, she appointed eight out of 18 ministers as women. And that was called the women government. And this is known to be a point in Norway's political history that set the stage for women's rights in government. After that, after 1986, it has been political impossible. It's political impossible in Norway to have a government with less than 40% women. It's not the legislation, but it's politically impossible. In my second government, we proposed changes in the equality of status legislation in Norway strengthening the role of the women in all sectors of society. And I appoint, appointed a state secretary, we call it in Norway, in my prime minister's office, who had to work with and for equality issues all the time. And he had to ensure a 40-60 distribution of men and women in all governmental committees uh, and boards. 
Let me also mention, and that was rather radical, and it was uh, touched upon in the first session, that my government passed a new law in 2005 that says that all boards of private joint stock companies and also all main state-owned companies with more than four members in the board need to have a 40-60 distribution of men and women. Many from the business community said this is impossible to implement. But we gave them two years of transition. And after two years, from 2006 to 2008, almost all companies made it. It was possible. And the result was that the participation of women in business companies' boards increased during two years from 7% to 45%. So that was a very uh, interesting experience. So I have to end up now my first intervention, but I will say that I believe systems of quotations will be essential and is necessary to promote women's participation, at least in periods of transition. Norway was also the first country in the world with uh, appointing a so-called equal rights ombud, an institutionalized watchdog for equal rights. And that has served very well. I think I can say that I have, through my political career, career worked to promote women's participation in politics and in public life in general. I believe a balanced distribution of sexes in all areas of society is important to assure democracy. And for me, it's also in accordance, since you mentioned that I'm a minister in another sense, it's in, accord in accordance with my, my um, ethical values, Christian ethical values. Equality between men and women exists when both sexes are able to share equally in the distribution of power and influence. Gender equality implies a society in which women and men enjoy the same opportunities, outcomes, rights, and obligations in all spheres of lives. Change does not make itself. Awareness of what needs to be done, however, might bring you halfway. But to succeed, go the whole way. Men must stand up for the rights of the women. That is important. Thank you very much. We'll move straight on to our second initiator, President Lathos. And I'd like to ask you to really to take further some of the d discussion that was in the earlier session. It's clear that there's still a debate about whether quotas are an effective way of ensuring greater access in terms of political participation for women. And I'd like to ask you for your views on that. Well, thank you. Uh, to some extent, this panel is a sort of a follow-up of the previous panel, but let me tell you that I think that the question of quotas emerge whenever you have a, quite a number of educators, but very few principals in the schools are going to be female. Quite a number of uh, members in the judiciary, the majority of them in today's Chile are women, but none of them used to be at the Supreme Court, and so on and so on. Therefore, you have enough qualification. That means that society already were in a position to assure a woman or a man similar possibilities, at least from the point of view of education but not from the point of view of the final position. And probably this was the reason why I never promised as a candidate. But when I assumed, I decided to have at least one third in my cabinet are going to be women. That was very unusual in Chile. And one third of the governors, the governors, Chile is a central country, are appointed by the president. Of the governors, as a woman. And it seemed to me in another reshuffle of the, of the government, and I appointed ministers, female ministers in foreign affairs, in education, in health, I mean in the major ministries. 
The big issue came when I had to make a reshuffle of the cabinet in my third year, and I appointed a woman that used to be the Minister of Health to the Minister of Defense. Oh my God, and that was different. To have a woman reviewing the troops is rather unusual. And the fact was, I say, that because one was in foreign affair and the other was in defense, at the time when my presidential term was approaching to the end, two women were positioned as the best potential candidate for president. And I think that that was the reason why in Chile, we never had a discussion, but you are serious. Are you going to tell me that a woman can be president? Well, that kind of discussion never took place in Chile. And my idea is simply because there was not only one, like in this country, for eight years ago, four, four and a half years ago, because the discussion here was really about do you think a woman can be president in this country? But simply because you have two, there was no discussion in Chile. And I think that that, that was really big, a big difference. Nevertheless, let me go to the question of quotas. It seemed to me, when we were fighting for democracy to recover in Chile, women play a very substantial role. And what the motto was, democracy in the country and in the house. And democracy in the house, all of us understand what that means for that, you know. Anyhow, we decided in my own party to introduce the question of quotas. 20% to be candidate for all those uh, situations where you need to have uh, some collective decision. The, 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 the national board, the provincial board, uh, the, the state board, etc., or the communal board. And then the question was to increase to 40% the quota, internally in the party. And then the decision was this is not enough because even though you are candidate, you are never elected. And the big issue was to say, look, no matter what is going to be the result of the election, at least one third are going to be women in, in those uh, collective uh, body. And how are you going to elect those that has not voted enough according to those that, according to the vote that they got, will go into cover? Why I say this? Because this was voluntary in terms of the party. Nevertheless, after six years, there was no need to apply the quota system because in most of the collective bodies, you have more than 40%. Why I say this? Because the big issue is going to be, what are you going to do when you have a system in order that you can have a place in the ballot but you are not going to be elected. If it is possible to have some kind of system similar where you are going to fill in order to fulfill the quota, because in today's parliament, even though we had already a woman, in my term, I was able to appoint the first uh, two, two women to the Supreme Court and, and, and so on and so forth. Nevertheless, the big issue is still with regard to the private sector and the boards in the major firms. Almost no women, almost no women, really. And then the question is, is it possible to have a quota? That's one point. But I would like to add another thing, quite different, nothing to do with quota. One of our programs, better, I correct myself, one of my wife, favorite program was Woman Smile. We were in the campaign and she told me, have you realized how many women at the time that they are talking with you, talk with you with some hand covering in the mouth? Simply because they have no dental tissues in their mouth? Because you are extremely poor and when you are extremely poor, you have no money to go to a dentist to take care of your dental pieces. And therefore, you don't have mental And the most successful program was the Woman Smile. 
And Goodman Smile was a program by which you are going to be able to have a program to put the dental pieces to the woman, to the poor woman in Chile. And this has to do with human dignity. And one of the things that I should have done was to publish the number of letters that because of that program, not me, but my wife <laughs> received. After 30 years, my husband took me to the movie. After so many years, now I'm able to attend the school as a parent and to participate in the discussion with the other parents of my, in my school. In other words, to what extent this is really something to empower a lot of women that because they are poor, they have no chances to speak themselves. Final point, for my experience, we discover that if you are the head of a household, is a woman. In other words, the only wage earner in that house is a woman. There is no question that probably 90% of those women are under the poverty line. Therefore, if you have some kind of a different social subsidies, mechanism, etc., whatever it is, if you are going to apply for a social house and you are a woman, the only wage earner in the family, automatically the house is allocated. Because you can be 100% sure that that woman is under the poverty line. In short, it's not only a question of quota, political system, political representation that you can have, but it's also, what about when you have a very unequal country and therefore a huge number of women are under that? And to what extent can you focalize in them in order to have a better situation? This, I think, really is a question that really matters if you want to have a progress in this particular field. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's really interesting that both of our initiators have spoken beyond quotas and have spoken of the fact that actually if you want to change, if you want real social change, social justice, it's actually going to take a number of different types of interventions to make sure that there's forward progress. And with that, we'll move to our final initiator um, this afternoon. Can you all, those of you who will need headsets, President Zapatero will be speaking in Spanish. And I would like um, to ask you, in addition, or while you're making your remarks, just to speak a little bit about how you were able to make that gender equality within your, uh, gender equity within your cabinet work. I think there are many countries in the world that speak of the importance of equity for women. There are very few that are able to make them happen. And I think that the examples that have already been given would be further enriched by your um, being able to put that forward. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Eh, en primer lugar, desearía felicitar al Club de Madrid porque haya elegido el tema de los derechos de la mujer o de la igualdad. En segundo lugar, cuando estamos hablando de los derechos de la mujer, estamos hablando de la democracia, de la esencia de la democracia. Siempre que participo en algún debate de esta naturaleza, eh, pienso que la historia es una pesadilla. La historia es una pesadilla. No nos podemos sentir nada orgullosos de la historia de la humanidad. Nada orgullosos. El siglo XX irradia alguna luz, se consolida las democracias. Para las mujeres es el primer momento de esperanza. Hay derecho al voto, no en todos los sitios. Es el siglo XX donde las mujeres empiezan a trabajar pero nos hemos parado a pensar un minuto que la historia de la humanidad es la historia de la dominación, de la dominación. Eh, 
es la historia de los más fuertes sobre los más débiles. En todo. Y la discriminación más grave, más severa, más injusta, más inhumana, ha sido la discriminación de las mujeres a lo largo de la historia. Yo sigo cuando participo en estos debates, eh, no lo puedo hacer tranquilo. Lo hago enfadado de que hayamos vivido así los hombres y las mujeres, con la discriminación y la dominación. Por tanto, la cuestión es la raíz de la convivencia, de la raíz de la democracia. Eh, igual que una sociedad de seres humanos dignos aspira a repartir la riqueza, no se puede entender que la libertad no esté repartida al 100%, que la independencia, que la autonomía no esté redistribuida al 100% entre todos los seres, entre todas las personas de una sociedad. Por lo tanto, no cabe adoptar otra posición que una posición radical, radical, contundente, de ir a la raíz. Cotas. Estoy seguro que si se tratara de plantear las cuotas para los hombres no habría debate. Sie siempre he pensado eso. Pero atención, la dominación, la dominación de los hombres sobre las mujeres en la política, en la empresa, en la educación, en la cultura, en las iglesias, en todos los ámbitos de poder, ha sido uno de los factores de, que ha impedido el progreso a la civilización. Es muy curioso, supongo que esta reflexión se la habrá hecho el presidente Lagos y el primer ministro que está con nosotros. Muy curioso advertir que los sitios de más poder, en mi experiencia, de más poder, es donde más difícil es que haya mujeres. Observen los bancos centrales. En el Banco Central Europeo no hay una sola mujer. Observemos los estados mayores de los ejércitos. Los estados mayores de los ejércitos. Las grandes compañías multinacionales. Las iglesias. Sin embargo, allí donde el trabajo es más duro, donde menos poder hay, más mujeres tenemos. Esta es la realidad. Es una realidad tan injusta como indigna. Y no se puede abordar ni poner el focus sobre la igualdad de los hombres y las mujeres sin ir a una de las cuestiones más duras, a la primera para mí que es la violencia de género, el maltrato presente en todas las sociedades. Y que es la expresión más clara de la dominación. Yo fui la primera ley que aprobé, una ley contra la violencia de género. En mi país hay estadísticas fiables, pero en todos los países. Hay unos 70, 80 mujeres que mueren a manos del machismo criminal, de la dominación que el hombre quiere ejercer sobre la mujer. Y hay miles de, de mujeres maltratadas. Hay que establecer duras sanciones, apoyar socialmente, prevenir. Y claro que hay que establecer cuotas. 
es la única manera. Si las leyes están para eso. La ley se inventó para establecer derechos. La democracia no es más que conjugar derechos y abrir los terrenos y los espacios a la igualdad. Ahora nos podemos felicitar en una parte del mundo las mujeres están ya en la política, en los gobiernos. Yo siempre tuve la mitad de mujeres y de hombres. En los parlamentos, en Europa, treinta y tantos, cuarenta y tantos por ciento, en muchos países del mundo. Pero tienen que pasar la barrera al sector económico, al sector audiovisual, al sector de la cultura, de las instituciones financieras y solo la ley lo puede hacer cambiar. Europa va a probar que las grandes empresas que cotizan tengan el 40% de mujeres. Va a ser un gran avance. Y yo no me planteo si es más eficaz o no para la empresa. Doy por supuesto que sí, no tengo ninguna duda. Lo que digo sencillamente es que es injusto, injusto, que no haya tantas mujeres en los consejos de administración como hombres. Porque sabemos por qué. Los datos son elocuentes. Las mujeres que llegan al más alto nivel en la empresa, la mitad no tienen hijos. Y su tasa de fecundidad es tres veces menos que la media. Es decir, es su compromiso dominante frente al varón en la educación de los hijos, en las tareas de la familia, la que la limite, la impide, en gran medida, poder acceder a las más altas cúpulas de las empresas, igual que en los otros terrenos. Por tanto, cotas sí, para siempre contundentes. Y ningún miedo a la igualdad. ¿Quién puede tener miedo a la igualdad? ¿Quién puede tener miedo a sentirse igual? A veces se compara, o a veces se invoca la, 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 la dominación de minorías. A mí me resulta un poco fuerte. Es verdad que la historia de la humanidad es la historia de la esclavitud en gran medida, de esclavitud de unos seres humanos a otros, pero me resulta un poco fuerte que la mitad de la humanidad se la compare con una minoría y que realmente haya sido dominada, duramente dominada. Por eso todo lo que sea extender derechos, como ahora que ha empezado una gran cadena de la libertad en favor también de los derechos de los homosexuales y reconocimiento de su igualdad por ley de su matrimonio en muchos países, incluido en varios estados de Estados Unidos, estaremos ganando espacios a la libertad y a la igualdad. Y esto puede ser que anticipe un, un siglo XXI en el que nos podamos sentir algo más orgullosos que en la historia de la humanidad. Eh, este no es un tema uno más, no es un tema más de la democracia ni de la política, no, es el tema crucial. Si hay política y si hay democracia es para que haya igualdad y participación y justicia. Si no hay ni justicia, ni igualdad, ni participación, ni democracia, si las mujeres siguen, como todavía están, dominadas en tantos ámbitos y en tantos países. Nada más. Thank you very much. to all three of you after we've had the next three speakers, because I think all three of you have mentioned some of the wider contextual issues that have to be considered if we are looking at issues of democracy. You've spoken around issues of dignity, issues of ethical consideration, 
But what I'd like to do is move um, some of your comments into the next speaker's comments, because you've also spoken about a focus on political participation, which has sometimes been undermined by a lack of focus on an economic agenda and what's happening within the private sector. And Irene Natividad, I think in view of some of the work that you've been doing, which actually straddles the political and the private sector work, that you might be able to give us some of your thoughts on the extent to which quotas are or are not working and what the constructive areas are in relation to them, as well as the downsides that you've seen in some of the work that you've been doing. Okay. I'm going to talk positively because there are positive things happening. I'm going to focus primarily on quotas for women on corporate boards. And let me tell you, I'm going to stand because I belong to the minority of the short and nobody ever sees me. <laughs> Fortunately, I have a six foot tall voice. What the, uh, what the former prime minister of Norway talked about, the quota that Norway precipitated for women on corporate boards created a tsunami a momentum towards changing the board composition of the largest companies, primarily in Europe. This momentum is Europe-driven, and it's happening in Europe at a time when it's going through its most difficult economic crisis ever. So that at the end of this decade, Europe will have a changed board composition of its major companies that happened while it was having this very difficult time. Now, why, was, why is this uh, strategy being adopted? The reason why it's become popular is because it's a top-down strategy. In other words, if we put, we did down up, we did bottom up, and we said, if we could just get more women educated, if we could just get more of them trained, if we could just hire enough women, they will naturally rise to the top. Well, what dis we discovered is that there's natu nothing natural about rising to the top. After several years, for instance, in the United States, women are stuck at middle management. 50 to 60% of middle managers in our major companies are women. But when you look at the top, we're not there. 4% of CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies are women. Only 17% are in senior management. So for me, as an American, I love what's happening in Europe. Now, I want to give you a sense of this momentum, because it's one thing to say, well, Norway did it. Well, it's very important precisely because Norway did it and was successful in implementing a quota in a two-year period, other countries followed suit. So what are those countries? Slide, please. Let me show you. Look at this, okay? I can't read because I not only can't walk anymore, I can't read. So after Norway, Spain was the first country in Europe to have a quota for women on corporate boards. And then France followed by Iceland, Netherlands. Last year, in 2011, four countries, Netherlands, Italy. Italy has a quota for women on corporate boards, if you can believe it. Um, Belgium. And not only that, it has spilled over to Malaysia. Malaysia now has a quota of 30% of board seats for, um, for all publicly listed companies must be female. And it was announced by the prime minister himself. It's the first Asian country and the first Muslim-dominated country that has a quota for women on corporate boards. Now, if you look at the middle list, it is a list of countries with quotas for state-owned companies. And what are those? Well, that's the majority of companies in many countries that are developed or developing. For instance, in Norway, Statoil is a state-owned company, right? 40% of the board is female. In Brazil, Petrobras, the largest company, is a state-owned company. So quotas for women on the boards of state-owned companies are a very big deal because they deal with utilities, they're dealing with airlines, energy, you name it, the very largest companies. So look at the countries. Israel began it in 1993, 30% of board seats must be female. And then South Africa in 1996 as a post-apartheid way of integrating the business, um, the business community. Um, and then it was followed by Denmark, Finland, Ireland, Iceland, most recently Austria and Slovenia, and then look, Kenya, okay? So it's spilling over now to Africa. 
and most recently, as of last week, the cabinet of the UAE, United Arab Emirates, announced that they will now require women on boards of their companies. They didn't state exactly whether it's a percentage or just any woman, but the fact that they even, that the cabinet passed it, is really significant. Now, um, Berlin and Nuremberg, these are two cities in Germany that have quotas for any companies based in those cities or in which the city has municipal equity. There's no federal quota yet, even though Minister von der Leyen of Germany is pushing hard, but as you can see, two cities, and it was driven by the mayors of those cities, have quotas for women on boards in companies based there. Quebec, you know that part of Canada that's always trying to get out? Well, Quebec has a quota for 50% of board seats in Crown Health, government-owned companies based in Quebec, must be female. They're now at 42%. So. This is spilling over. Brazil, I opened the stock exchange last month in Sao Paulo because Brazil is proposing a quota for women on corporate boards and they're following Europe's lead. And then it's also, of course, we discussed the European Commission. It is a proposal. It is now being discussed both in Parliament and in the Council, it hasn't passed. But frankly, even if it doesn't pass, it is too late. Other countries in Europe will have adopted it way before the European Commission will have passed it. So it doesn't matter. And now, what are the other countries? The Philippines is looking at it. You know, as you can tell, it is now really zooming all over. So I wanted you to see this because it's one thing to say, oh, we, there are quotas in some countries. It is a lot of countries and it is moving quickly. This is a strategy that came from the political arena. The reason it started in Europe is because it was a strategy for political participation that has now been adopted and applied to the business sector. It is a strategy that is familiar to many countries. So the question is, does it work? Slide, please. Slide, please. We took a look at the 200 Corporate Women Directors International. We've done research for 16 years on women on corporate boards globally. We took a look at the 200 largest companies in the world based in 27 countries. 13.8% of board seats are held by women average. For those companies based in countries where there's a quota, 16.1%. We then, slide please. We then took a look at two specific countries. We took a look at France. Look, what, look at this. It began at 6.4% before the quota, okay? Guess where they're now? 23.7%. That is amazing. That percentage increase in five years would never have been possible without a quota. And look at Spain. Spain began at 6%, not as dramatic a growth, but they're now at 12.1% as of last year. This is amazing. The normal percentage of growth for women on boards is normally 1% or less. This happened because of quotas. Okay, now, you have heard mentioned what many women and some men say all the time. You know, this one, I testified at the European Parliament on this issue, and there was a parliamentarian from Italy who said, you know, if I am promoted to a board of a company, I want to make sure it's because I am skilled and experienced, not because I'm part of a number. I am so bored with that argument. So we took a look at 113 women who were appointed to board seats in France from 2009 to 2011. Took a look at their resumes to find out who precisely are getting on those boards. Slide, please. Slide, please. What we discovered, 67% of the board appointees were corporate executives. 3% entrepreneurs of very big businesses. Another 3% professionals, doctors, lawyers, and then you've got academics, deans of business schools, etc. What you cannot see from this is that these women were at the top of their game. The resumes were absolutely incredible. Now, these women were in France all that time, right? Because of the quota, they were found. You know how some companies say, we would love to have a woman on our board, we just can't find them. Well, look, they got found. So that's what a quota does. So, no, I mean, it, it, really, isn't, it really isn't funny because the argument against women's access to seats, whether they are on boards of companies or they are for government positions, is that somehow 
the qualified ones aren't there. Well, we have a whole legion of overqualified women who are overeducated. The, in Norway, the Institute for Social, I forgot the exact name of the institute, took a study. What, who are these women who got appointed and became 40% of boards? What they found, they tended to be younger. They tended to be more educated than the male directors. Meetings tended to start earlier and on time. They were better prepared than the male directors, and so on, right? I think at the end of the game, what will happen is in the same way that critical mass of women in parliament impact on legislation, the critical mass of women on corporate boards hopefully will change direction of some companies for the better. There are now tons of studies. It was mentioned before. They're called the business case studies. McKinsey was mentioned, but actually there's a bibliography of 32 individual studies that show the more women in senior management and the more women on boards, the better is the financial performance of a company, whether it's return on assets, return on, equi on equity, or uh, heightened financial oversight. So the only argument for women on corporate boards is that it's good for the companies and it's good for the economy. Fairness and justice and morality haven't worked. That language doesn't exist anymore. So what does work is that we are needed to be on those boards and in senior management to help economies do better. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, I think we'll, there'll be a lot of questions to, to follow on. So I'm going to move very quickly on to Laura Liz, Liswood. Um, Again, to look at that link between the public um, sector, the political sphere, and the private sphere, I think of real interest is the fact that you did um, a study fairly recently of women world leaders. And I'd love to hear what you found out about the role of, um, or the relevance even, of quotas in their progression in their life, in addition to your own experience about affirmative action tools and the ways in which we can actually promote this area of equity. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, it seems to me, at f first though, we, we need to actually, before you go on to that, is in my mind to step back just a little bit and maybe hover at 10,000 feet and, and look at this issue of homogeneity and heterogeneity and what are we talking about here. Um, uh, James Sarawicki in his book, The Wisdom of Crowds, says if you have a homogeneous group of people and you add another member of the homogeneous group to the homogeneous group, they bond quite quickly. They're homogeneous, they're alike. But he says, but the incremental innovation and creativity is slight. He says if you add a member of the heterogeneous group to the homogeneous group, they don't bond very quickly. They're not alike. But he says the potential, incremental creativity and innovation are much greater. Yeah. So having heterogeneity turns out to be an important thing to have. Um, some of you may know uh, in the United States we have this show, and unfortunately I think it's been imported to other countries, uh, called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Mm. Yeah, okay, you don't watch it but you know it. Um, but um, on this show, uh, you have three lifelines. The first lifeline is you can call a friend, right? Well, nobody calls a stupid friend. So the probability of getting a correct answer from your smart friend is 65%. The second thing you can do is have them cross off two answers. That'll increase your probability of success to 75%. The third thing you can do is poll the large, diverse audience. That will increase your probability of success to 91% to get the correct answer. So if any of you go on the show, poll the audience um, <laughs> because you'll get the correct answer from the large, diverse audience. Um, and in organizations, homogeneity actually works better than heterogeneity. But you have to have three conditions in your organization to make it work better. Because homogeneity is easier. You add women to a board, it changes the dynamic to it. You know. um, but the three conditions are, in homogeneity, to work better, is that the problems have to be simple, the communication has to be easy, and the environment can't be changing. Okay. So in other words, if you, have 50, if you need 50 holes dug, all you need is 50 hole diggers. You know. 
But the fact of the matter is, every one of the organizations we're in are complex organizations, where the problems are difficult, the communications are hard, and the environment is changing. So stepping back and saying, okay, well, we need heterogeneity. We need this, you know. And um, I'm not one to normally quote uh, Donald Rumsfeld, uh, former Secretary of Defense of the United States. But he did say something about having known knowns. And there are a lot of known knowns out there. Irene was just articulating some of those known knowns. The fact that, as Catalyst points out, you have three or more women on a board, your ROE, ROS, ROI is going to go up. It's not causal, it's correlative. You know, so it's important to understand that. But the World Economic Forum has analyzed the competitiveness report with the gender gap report and found a direct correlation. Those countries that have closed the gender gap have a, a better competitiveness rating. So we know these kinds of things already. These things are known to us. We know that, for example, Credit Suisse has just come out with a new research report that th the companies will be less volatile if they have more women on their board. The debt to equity ratio will not be as high if more, there are more women on boards because there's a slightly different risk profile that comes along with that. So we, we know these kinds of things. But then when we begin to, begin to look at what are some of the barriers, why, as Irene was saying, they basically, and I think when, um, you were saying this also, uh, President, which is that in most organizations, most political processes, we don't have an intake problem anymore. There's a lot of women coming into the lower levels of organizations, graduating from schools, et cetera. We don't have an intake problem in the political side. We have an upgrade problem. Yeah. They're coming in, but they're not going up. And there's something going on that's causing this blockage, if you will, because it's not a natural pipeline. And part of it is somewhat like what we perceive of what leadership looks like. And um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in his book, Blink, talks about the fact that in the United States, 16% of men in the United States are six feet or taller, 184 centimeters. 16% of men in the United States are 184 centimeters or taller. Then they measure the height of Fortune 500 male CEOs. 57% of Fortune 500 male CEOs are 184 centimeters or taller. Right? Well, that's four times the cohort right, of the 16%. Now, I've met a lot of great leaders. I mean, I've had the honor of working with Prime Minister Campbell. I've had the honor of working with President Robinson and many other leaders. And I've done a lot of research on this stuff. I have yet to see any research that correlates leadership ability and skeletal structure. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we're at four times the cohort. You know. So something is going on. We have a perception of what a leader looks like. You know, in addition to which, I will have to say that dominant group members live in a different world than non-dominant group members do. Um, and I, I attribute this, or I, I learned from this based on a lot of research. For example, in, um, in uh, uh, Bain and Company has done some really interesting research that 66% of men believe that women have equal opportunity. Less than 30% of women agree with that statement. Uh, another statement, it is almost impossible for women to progress to executive level in male-dominated sectors like the financial services. 61% of women agree with that statement. 85% of men disagree with that statement. So living in totally different worlds in terms of what people understand are some of the reasons that women don't get along. And I have this sort of framework that I call the elephant and the mouse. Uh, if you're the elephant in the room, what do you need to know about the mouse? Not much. If you're the mouse in the room, what do you need to know about the elephant? Everything, everything. So dominant group members don't know a lot about what's going on with non-dominant group members. Non-dominant group members have a tendency to know everything about dominant group members. So women have a tendency to kind of know what some of this stuff is. Dominant group members have a tendency to not know what some of this stuff is. Now, sort of moving on to quotas, I am a particular fan of controlled experiments. And I think Norway is an interesting controlled experiment. Because if I believe, Prime Minister, initially, um, the legislature told companies, we highly encourage you to add women to the boards. I think it was a highly encouraged language or something, at least initially. Um, you're sort of giving them fair warning about the quotas. 
in a, my research reading was that the number of women went from 7% women to 8% women in the highly encouraged approach. Right. Uh, then, of course, you did introduce this, and I believe the, the consequence of not getting to 40% of the opposite gender, and you correct me if I'm wrong, is something like the company is delisted from the Norwegian Stock Exchange, right? So they did find the women, you know, as former presidential candidate Romney said, they had binders of them, <laughs> which they found. Uh, but the, I like the controlled experiment, and Irene was beginning to allude to it. The research that I have read that has shown that what has happened now that you get to a critical mass is in fact that uh, a couple of things that they've observed in governance processes. Uh, one, uh, women do read the board materials. Uh, so that now the men are reading the board materials. So everyone's coming better prepared to the board. Two, more of the board decisions are being made within the boardroom, not nightclub, country club, golf course. So transparency levels are going up in board governance processes. Uh, three, women ask more questions. Uh, four, uh, men will have a tendency to look at the short-term impact of board decisions. Women will have a tendency to look at the long-term impact of board decisions. Now, best boards look at short-term and long-term, the value of the, the diversity. Uh, men will have a tendency to look at the sh uh, shareholder impact of board decisions. Women will have a tendency to look at the stakeholder impact of board decisions, stakeholders being communities, environments, et cetera. Best boards look at shareholder and stakeholder. So I like it as a controlled experiment because it's really telling us something. You know, quotas themselves, I look at them as President Robinson said, as tools, as what I would call circuit breakers. Uh, to me, they're a way to what I would call hurry history. You know, because we've already heard all the statistics about if you wait, you know, if we, we can get there. We just have to live another 400 years to get there. Um, and so, you know, I like quotas as a circuit breaker. Are they a perfect system? No, but uh, you know, it's a little bit like what Winston Churchill saying about democracy. It's not a very good system, but it's better than all the others. Yeah. So it's an imperfect system, but it's probably the only one that's going to create inflection points for us to move as quickly as we can to get to this point where we get the value of the heterogeneity. Now, me personally, I've, I've, and, and incidentally, I think there's a lot of research around India with the requirement that one third of the local villages have women on their city council, on their local councils. And they've discovered that the, uh, the allocation of uh, local budgets now goes more to water, more to health care, et cetera. But the most interesting thing for me was, after about three generations of these women being on the city council, the one third mandate, the preference for sons is going down in these particular villages with this. So to me, these kind of, this kind of evidence is really very, very interesting. You know, people often ask me, you know, am I optimistic, am I pessimistic about it? And some of you may appreciate this. I heard uh, former Prime Minister of England, uh, Great Britain, uh, John Major once uh, talking, uh, and he said he had called Boris Yeltsin to ask him how it was going in Russia. And he said, so Boris, tell me in one word how it's going in Russia. And Yeltsin responds, good. And so he says, well, maybe you better elaborate. Tell me in two words how it's going in Russia. And Yeltsin responds, not good. So <laughs> I think that's where I am with this issue. <laughs> Thank you very much. And then I'll move very quickly on to our last panelist so that we can have some time for discussion and interaction and further questions. And so I'm going to turn to Jenny Klugman, who's currently the Director of Gender and Development. Many women in leadership positions. Um, to change this, we have to make the men more responsible for their duties in home, in their homes. The working hours need to be more flexible, and there needs to be more systematic institutionalized arrangements for child care. To sum it up, it, to, to increase the uh, participation of women in public life and in business life, it must be so possible also for women to combine family, children, and leadership positions. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd 
Just before I um, thank all of our speakers, I'm not going to attempt to sum up the whole of the discussion because <laughs> it's been very rich and we've got very little time. Um, however, I would like to just highlight some of the similarities that came out in, in this discussion. The argument that quotas are not enough, that they're one tool and a tool that can be successful, but only successful when they're in the context of other tools being used. I think that there were some very important statements made about the underlying issues that have to be looked at, including the fact that there are some core issues of inequality, some to do with economic inequality and poverty, some to do with other rights-based um, inequalities, but all of which affect whether or not you do get good, strong representation of women, whether it's in the private sector or in the political sector. Um, I, I, I'm head up an organization called the African Women's Development Fund, and one of the things we've seen in the work that we've been doing with African women actually reflects that, that if you do not work and enable women to have economic security, then you actively undermine their ability to have full and equal political participation um, in all areas of um, decision making, private sector and um, governmental. I think that the issues that were raised about homogeneity and heterogeneity, I can't say that word, are equally important because we can have excellent quota systems which end up actually introducing women onto boards, into politics, but those women are then a reflection of the inequality that already exists. So then we don't change a system, we just bolster it up. And I think it's really important for us to consider that. It's not just about numbers, it's also about transformation and transformational agendas. And the last thing that I'd like to say is that, you know, it's not women who are always our worst enemies. I just want to say that I personally have been mentored by some absolutely fabulous African women who've had to fight every inch of the way to get to where they want to get. And that maybe the issue of fighting for national liberation, fighting for justice in other areas, is one of the things that can then motivate people to fight for justice in terms of gender equality. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. I think it was a really rich discussion, and I'm only sorry that we didn't have time to take it further. Thank you.